Much of the Bible consists of stories. A narrator tells us about something that happened, and the narrative often focuses on one particular person. Sometimes the narrator adds a comment uh, and tells us whether that person did something good or, or something bad, whether she or he acted wisely or unwisely, but we're often not told whether it was good or bad, whether it was wise or unwise, and we have to decide for ourselves. That's pretty common in the Old Testament, especially in Genesis. So, for example, we have to decide for ourselves how Jacob behaved in relation to his brother Esau, whether Jacob was simply a con man and a thief who stole his brother's inheritance. And yeah, the, the usual answer is that Jacob was a great deceiver, up to no good at all. I'm indebted to my father for, for pointing out that actually Jacob was in the right and his brother Esau was in the wrong. And it may seem surprising, but you can check it out if you, if you look at the comments made about Esau in the New Testament. We, we can get it wrong when we decide for ourselves. I'm going to stick my neck out and suggest that two of the earliest incidents recorded in the Book of Acts show the Apostles acting unwisely, led by Peter. I may be wrong, but that's the conclusion I came to when I, I read the early chapters of Acts recently. The first incident comes at the end of the first chapter. Jesus had gone up to heaven. Judas had committed suicide. There used to be 12 disciples, now there were 11. And Peter addressed the other 10 like this. It is necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. A man called Matthias was chosen. But was Peter acting wisely in the way he invited the other ten to choose a replacement? Or even in wanting a replacement? They were to look for a replacement who was very much one of their own kind. Someone who, in Peter's words, was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. Were Peter and the other apostles just being a bit protective of their group identity and playing safe by looking for someone they knew would fit in? Someone that they already had very good knowledge of? I used to think that the disciples did the right thing. But that was purely on the grounds that there were 11 good men. Now, I'm not sure that they did the right thing. I can't see anything in the narrative to say whether they were right or wrong. Was someone just like the other 11 what Jesus had in mind? Remember that the original 12 were the personal choices of Jesus himself. Or was Jesus at that very moment lining up Paul as the next apostle? Paul was so different from the others. He was well educated. They weren't. He was a Jew like them, but uniquely he was also a Roman citizen. He, he wasn't from Judea or Galilee or even Samaria. He was from Asia Minor. And he had a lot of rough edges, uh, a very unlikely fit with the, with the group of 11 apostles. But Paul was the personal choice of Jesus himself. It was Jesus who called Paul on the road to Damascus and Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles. That made him the 13th apostle then. So should Peter and the other 10 have depended rather more on Jesus and waited for his personal choice? Did they perhaps jump the gun? 
Let me suggest that one of the questionable, questionable acts of the Apostles was in choosing a replacement. The other incident comes a bit later, but still fairly early on in the life of the Church. The Apostles needed people to look after the distribution of aid to widows. To quote from chapter 6, the Twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Seven men were duly appointed. Yes, of course, it was wise to rope in more people to help, but I'm, I'm not sure about the Apostles' motivation. They said that they didn't want to get involved in pastoral matters because they had a much more important job to do, preaching the Gospel. They were setting themselves above the rather menial jobs of administrators and setting themselves apart, being too important to wait on tables. We're told who the seven men were, and the first two who are named are Stephen and Philip. What's recorded next in Acts is very interesting. We're in chapter 6, remember? Up till now, the book of Acts is the book of the Acts of the Apostles, but the rest of chapter 6 is all about Stephen, the first of the seven, and the whole of chapter 7 is about Stephen. Chapter 8 is about Philip, the second of the seven. Uh, apart from a bit in the middle of chapter 8, the Apostles don't get another look in until the end of chapter 9, because chapter 9 is mostly about Paul on the road to Damascus and what happened to him after that. The Apostles are sidelined in the narrative in favour of two administrators and an outsider. So... What were Stephen and Philip doing? They were both preaching the gospel. They were doing what the apostles thought was their role. And Stephen did it so well that the Jewish ruling council, Jew, Jew, Jewish ruling council condemned him to death. Then Philip preached the gospel outside the jurisdiction of the Jews, first converting Samaritans, they were sort of half-Jews, and then converting the first fully Gentile man, uh, an Ethiopian eunuch. So these mere administrators, who were dismissed as waiting on tables, were, were doing the more exalted task uh, for which the apostles thought they were very well fitted. We think Luke wrote the book of Acts, he was the narrator, and I reckon in chapters 7 and 8 he was punching home the lesson that the apostles had been rather too arrogant in thinking that they were above the more mundane tasks that the church needed and that they had better things to do. Had they forgotten that Jesus himself had literally got his hands dirty cooking breakfast for them over an open fire? That was one of the last things he did before he left them. Does their attitude in choosing a replacement and, and in choosing some administrators point up some lessons for us? I guess that most of us are members of some group or other. It may be a group within a church. Maybe the church itself is the group. Maybe it's a group at work, or a neighbourhood group, or a professional group. Is it worth examining our groups and asking whether we are unduly protective of its identity, or whether we are involved in an unnecessarily closed shop? 
or whether there is a feeling of elit elitism that undervalues the contributions of others. Perhaps the group as a whole is like this. Or maybe we are individually a bit like that. As far as I'm concerned, guilty as charged. Lord, we apologise for those times when we have felt that we are part of a, a privileged elite group. Uh, Lord, forgive us and help us to see that you may have different plans for the group than what we may hope or plan for. So Lord, let us be open to other people who are different from us and to the possibility of their joining us at your command. In Jesus' name, Amen.